Brilliant, we might as well get started then, being it's half past and those who are coming in late can join us. Welcome, Dan. <laughs> Um, right, well, we are Morning Startup. Thank you for making it down to the city this morning, bright-eyed and bushy-tailed. Um, Scott, unfortunately, can't be with us today. He's off promoting his business in the UK, which is great to see WA businesses expanding. Um, but uh, we have a format, and we've been going for quite a while, since 2011, and we have a format, which is um, shameless plugs and uh, introduce yourself. So we know who the normal suspects are, but we're interested to know who else is in the room that wouldn't normally come along. So um, who wants to, that hasn't done it before, because who wants to kind of stand up, introduce themselves, uh, maybe explain, you know, what it is you're working on, but more importantly, have an ask. So gentlemen here, go on. Thank you, haven't done this for me yet. Um, my name is Jim Ladyman. I've just started myself doing uh, BA and project management work in software. So I've been in software a little while. Um, this is an opportunity to test your ideas, document your ideas, so that it can give you confidence to talk to these guys. And if they've asked for anything more, we've got that backup of your idea documented out. So come hit me up. Thank you very much. Um, I'll say it again, there are still lots of people going to be coming in at the back. So those of you the last three rows, does anybody want to kind of just move forwards and get to know some of these beautiful people here at the front? <laughs> there is a couple of hundred dollar notes. We do slap a few underneath just to incentivize people. <laughs> Investment starts from the front row and then works back. Yeah. Is it Derek? Derek said that they're, they're always doing DD on you. So if you're at the front, so. brilliant. Just so there's more space. Perfect. Who else is brave enough to stand up and uh, give us a shout out? Good morning, Todd Mason, uh, Global Life on Water. We're producing a sustainable uh, floating tourism destination resort. It's a 77 metre vessel which will be floating out in Coburn Sound. So watch your space. It's quite detailed. So. Come and talk to me. Love to have a chat. And we've got probably time for one more. Anybody else want to brave enough to do it? Yep. Morning. Uh, my name's Jared. I'm the co-founder of MenuZen. Um, we're a digital menu platform that allows customers to create the best menus on the planet and eradicate PDF menus, as well as gain insights from where their menu is and what data they're getting from it and their customers to access information as fast as possible uh, and as accurately as possible. So if you ever want to try and find a, a restaurant, find somewhere to eat, you go on Google, you go on their Facebook, you go on their Instagram, you don't know what information there is to get, how accurate it is, we help solve that problem for uh, food service businesses. Brilliant, thank you very much. So we couldn't do this. Actually, there's a, we've got a big announcement and I want to sort of see how awake you are this morning. So before I go any further, this next Wednesday, every, um, there is a uh, Founder Sundowner. So if you want to join us down at Nowhere Man's Brewery, I think Scott will be back by that point, hopefully, to be there. We will confirm in the emails uh, out to you all, so make sure you've got that tick box. Um, ticked for receiving uh, updates from us. But next uh, <coughs> Wednesday uh, in April, basically, found a sundowner. So uh, come meet us and have a chat and have some beer. So, but we've actually, today's quite a big, momentous occasion because um, we officially hit 6,000 members. So I want to have a, oh yeah. <laughs> so, for those, for those of you who know Morning Startup, we've been going, it very much started like an AA meeting just around the corner here back in um, 2011, November 2011, and it's kind of grown into what it is now, which is one of the largest um, tech meetup groups in Australia. Um, and especially for WA, I think that if WA here, we should all pat ourselves on the back because we do uh, bat above the rest of the, the, the country. I'm slightly biased though, so yeah. Happy days, 6,000 members. Here's to 7,000, and hopefully we'll have those who remember the M2K party that we held a few years ago. We'll probably have another one just to celebrate 6,000 members. So, But we couldn't do it without the great help of some supporters. So I want to say a massive thank you to Ammo Marketing. Uh, Ammo Marketing provides a lot of the marketing and a lot of the events. If you've seen West Tech and the great uh, stuff that they've put out there, if you saw what happened with... Um, 
Um, the mayor of Perth, again supported by um, by Ammo to help get him elected. So no, it would be a big big shout out to Cam and the team there at uh, Ammo Marketing. If you are looking for some help into getting your name out there in the brand, then by all means check out uh, Ammo. Um, but also check out their Weird Growth podcast. So if you haven't subscribed, go and subscribe to that. Some great people on there um, sharing their knowledge, sharing how sometimes they failed, how they won, and hopefully helping you get some really good insight um, and from it. So yeah, big thank you to Ammo. Um, Glenn couldn't be here this morning, but if you are looking to recruit someone or you are looking for that next job, then check out Beach and Group um, Boutique Recruitment here in the city. Um, Glenn and his team have been supporting Morning Startup for, for a very, very long time and will always tell you, you know, what's the going rate for a developer here in Perth? What, what should I expect to pay for this? And always supporting. So thank you very much to Glenn and the team there. Um, I'm going to let Jesse do this because he's in the room. So for those of you who know Jesse, do you want to do this or I can do it for you? Sure. <laughs> ah, so Jesse's, I'll just introduce Jesse because he's a, a, a long standing member of Morning Startup and kindly, because he's moved his business across to Melbourne, um, he kindly supports us for the food here. So there is some food here afterwards and some breakfast. By all means, help yourself. But I'll let you do your pitch. Sure. Uh, good morning, everyone. Hi. I was with Dave in those AA meetings back in 20. 2011, we would sit and cry and talk about how hard it was. And um, through the grit and grind, we've all done really well. So I run KeepSpace. KeepSpace is an e-commerce fulfillment business. So what we do is people who have a passion for a product, they recognize that there's a lot of challenges in the operation process, getting warehousing and storing, getting good shipping rates. So we set up locations here in Perth with my wife and I back in 2016. And we just focused on being the backbone for you guys. And through that, uh, working through the challenges, getting fundraising from appropriate investors to be able to get really good sales structures with the marketing and he meeting all the guys to do really well, we just made sure the products went directly <coughs> as expected every single time. And the demand requested us to go to the East Coast, so we set up in Melbourne last year. And now we have two warehouses setting up in the SAS product all the way. The perfect reason for the food is mostly because you guys you know, when you start, you don't have a lot of cash, so we want to make sure you're fed from being here. Thank you very much. So yeah, if you have got like an e-commerce store or you want like that last, that fulfillment aspect, then check out Keep Space. Um, and a massive thank you to the New Industries Fund and, and Jitsi for sponsoring the uh, video of this. We are live streaming to the region, so um, apparently there's a, a watch group, a watch party happening in Joondalup, it's now regional, and um, also up in Geraldton as well and in other areas. So I just want to say a massive thank you to, to Charlie and the team and, and um, everybody at the New Industries Fund for, for supporting this. Hands up who applied for a Innovation Booster Grant. Oh, he's going to have a lot of work cut out reading on those. Good. Excellent. Good luck, by the way, for those who have applied. Hopefully you'll, you'll get your 40 grand. And lastly, but not least, certainly, we couldn't do this um, every two weeks without fail having some awesome presenters that we've got this morning. Without the help of Space Cube, they give us this space here in Riff every two weeks for free, and we bring beautiful people in like you. Um, I was speaking to Brody last night, and he was just saying that the, the statistic of like how many people we've brought into this space is is quite phenomenal. So, um, but again, it's it's a symbiont relationship. Thank you very much to the team. If you are looking for co-working space then check out here, or they've got Riff or Fern, and also, I mean, Brody's Empire is growing. We've got um, Sydney, and they've got the Tech Park over in, in Bentley now as well. So um, by all means, check out Space Scoop. Um, Startup News, who's subscribed to Startup News? If you haven't, make sure you do. Every Friday comes out, great news. It's your way of being connected to what's happening in the industry. Um, Startup WA, is there anybody here from Startup WA? Yay! Mm -hmm. So if you, Startup WA, thank you very much for their support, the sort of advocates to the government for what's happening here in the ecosystem. Uh, and then last, and Tech Board, if you haven't claimed your profile, jump on there and they always give good information about who's receiving funding and what's going on. And last but not least, Plus 8, did you want to give a quick two minute pitch oh. on Plus 8? Sure. There's nothing like being <laughs> put on the spot. Yeah, I love that. Kylie. 
Hey everyone. Um, so I'm Kylie and I'm the lead of the Plus 8 program. Uh, this is Perth's premier accelerator program. Um, if, you weren't, if you were there last night, I apologise because it will sound a bit rinse and repeat, but applications have just opened and they're open till the 26th of April. It's a six month program if you make it through the whole thing in two phases and you could end up sharing in an investment pool of around $450,000. So really worth being a part of. It's a great opportunity to be part of an awesome community, connect to our network and the wider network of Perth and also just be built into and help you accelerate your business faster than you would on your own. Brilliant. Thank you very much. And if you want to get in touch with us or you want to come and speak, we're always looking for great presenters here at Morning Startup. We'd love to, if you want to share something, by all means, hit us up at any of these and we'd love to have you uh, come and present. So this is Scott, this is not me. I, oh, no, sorry, we do have that. So it's not um, Chanel, it is Kylie, who will be here on uh, the next one, which is on the 12th of April, to talk about uh, how you can get involved and apply for plus eight. So again, apologies for the next slide. This is Scott. That brings ahead the formalities. Oh, oh come on, people. <laughs> Gee, I'll have to tell him, we have to remove that slide. <laughs> so, um, who's here? Want, who's here is looking for investment? Great, well this is a great talk on R&D <laughs> rebates, no. So, um, one thing WA has severely lacked uh, in the past has been um, the lack of local VCs or investment models. And so what we've seen recently, and, and for those of you in the know, you'd have seen the WAVE program, which was run by the government, to, or the local state government, to kind of introduce uh, three new bodies to WA um, to help local businesses sort of thrive and not have to go over east. We always claim that obviously Canva started here, um, which is a great story given that I think Canva was now apparently a bigger brand than the likes of um, Woolies, Telstra, and Combank in a recent report this week. Um, second biggest brand in Australia, apparently, globally. Um, so having uh, the investment to sort of start here and, and grow your business is super important. So today we've got in here, we've got Derek up here, and we've got Nigel from the three funds that have been awarded. And we're just gonna sit and have a fireside chat. There will be time for questions at the end. But um, we're going to go through and just kind of get to know what, what it's about, what does it mean for the WA ecosystem, and more importantly, how can you and your business get involved and uh, potentially talk to, to some of these, uh, to these companies. So kind of starting with you, Derek, being that you're the closest, can you kind of introduce, we'll check the mics. Can you, yep, perfect. Can you um, introduce yourself? Also, we know you, a lot of us know you for a long time, but introduce yourself, your fund, and, um, and, and more importantly, sort of um, how much you've got, I guess that's what a lot of us are interested <laughs> in, like how much is in the bank today, you know, and um, when do you expect to start sort of making investments and, and putting those time yeah, sheets? Awesome. And then we'll go, we'll go across. Yeah, um, I might just say a couple of quick things before I answer those questions. One, I just want to thank Dave and Scott because um, we talk about this idea of an ecosystem and for those of us that have been around a decade or more, um, now's the most exciting time. If you're just kind of connecting to the startup industry, it's like, wow, this is this thriving place. Uh, but Morning Startup, other than one other event that doesn't meet so often, is the longest running uh, startup event in Western Australia. So these guys have kind of seen it all, and I think that's kudos to you for kind of yeah. keep going and every two weeks getting up early. This is, I'm normally, yeah, it's worth it. <laughs> I am normally almost still in bed at this time, so... It is bad for your health. I said, a a walk-in this morning with a shower at 4.30 this morning, so... Yeah, and then maybe, I'd, probably not my role, but I'm, I think I'm probably on behalf of these guys, so I don't all have to say it. Um, I think Sandra's here today from Jetsy. Uh, obviously, getting the money that we have to help 
um, put towards getting funds started is really important. And again, we've got a state government at the moment that's um, making more investments and doing more than we've ever seen, which is great. And obviously the three of our organisations are beneficiaries of that. And um, it costs a lot to start up a fund, um, more than we're getting, but that's okay, because <laughs> um, it helps, right? And I think they ran a great process and did what they said they were going to do. And um, I think we're all grateful for that. And it's definitely helped. So that's awesome as well. So thanks, Sandra and the team. Oh, happy. Um, and then just a bit of context, if you've read any of the press releases this week, you probably heard me rabbiting on about this already, but just for context, the way we've been thinking about this at Purpose Ventures is we're, as Western Australia, we're 10% of the national population. And right now, we're normally about a 15% contributor to GDP, but we're actually a bit higher than that at the moment, about 17.5%. Now, not all venture does it this way, but a lot of early stage venture capital has a tax structure that we'll probably talk about later called a early stage venture capital limited partnership. And because that's a federal government program, all of those funds that you're familiar with have to register how much capital they've raised and how much capital they've deployed. And so right now in Australia, there's $4.5 billion of venture capital in Australia. And until uh, we got our ESV CLP registered on February the 1st, and I think that Nigel will probably share, I think these guys are trying to do it as well, um, there was no ESV CLPs in Western Australia. And as far as we understand, um, the, I'll talk about in a moment, the Better Labs fund that's been backed by the REC that was running, there is no structured, there was no structured venture funding in Western Australia. And so what that means is whilst we're 10% of the population, I'd look at that and go, well, surely we should be 10% of the venture capital market. That, that should mean, and I'm not sure we need $450 million, but we probably could spend that. And like, I'm, I'm looking at how many people in the room today and how many people, and, um, but the point is there's, there's work to be done and there's plenty of room for the three of us and what we're doing and more um, to, to, to fill a massive gap. So there's been so much talk for years about the need for WA to have a venture fund. And it's not about isolating us from the rest of the country uh, because we need to connect and we need to grow and scale and we need to co-invest with East Coast funds. But there is something unique about our time zone, our networks, the way we think, our access into um, plus eight markets. And, and so this has been a long, long, long time coming. And so it's pretty exciting. And I guess before I talk about purpose ventures, the last thing I want to say, and I think, again, hopefully this is true for all of us, it is actually about all you in the room. I know we're going to hear our stories, but I've been doing this for over a decade. And, you know, Kyle and I, our business, we had an exit um, through a company called GreenSense. And on the back of that decided rather than creating more companies ourselves, we would try and back other people. And it is an incredibly energising space. What you're doing, you're trying to start something because you found a problem that you deeply care about and you're trying to solve that and you're taking risks to make that happen. It might be working late at night, it might be putting some money in, it might be bootstrapping and giving up a, a day or a couple of days of work. And that's what we love and that's what we care about and that's what we want to be a part of. So as much as we're going to hear our story today, I just want you to know it's actually about what you're doing and how we support you achieve whatever it is that's driving you to, to solve this big problem in the world. So. Um, with all that said, um, right, Purpose Ventures. So my background, I've been in tech industry for about 25 years, started with PwC. Um, as I mentioned, I had a software company myself called GreenSense. I've sat in your shoes. I had to raise money. Um, I had many nights where we didn't know how we were going to pay our staff the next day. Um, and then things worked out and that company got acquired um, about nine years ago. And on the back of that, I set up a uh, investment group called Go Capital. We started investing in Perth companies, some of which you'll know. We had some of the first money into Health Engine, um, Isatana, a company called Specs. And as that was happening, I was approached by the RAC to help them with their innovation program. Um, that's a longer story in itself, but what happened is we ended up creating, um, for the last few years, probably Perth's only structured venture fund called Better Labs Ventures. And uh, we've invested in about 30 companies, 26 of those are West Australian, the portfolio is up, doing really, really well, and it's been a great journey. And quite frankly, I was pretty happy doing that. Um, but we got tapped on the shoulder about six months ago, um, and this is public knowledge, it's in the papers, by Malcolm Steinberg. Malcolm um, was the founder of Time Zone, among many other things, and he's super passionate about supporting WA entrepreneurs. 
And as he thinks about how he could do that, he obviously understood the gap in funding. Uh, and so we agreed terms for him to become the cornerstone investor in our business. And the result of that is today is my last day at Better Labs for those that know me in that role, which is a happy, sad kind of day, to be honest. I love what we've achieved there and sad to leave, but happy to get on this new adventure. And so Purpose Ventures, in a nutshell, is uh, we're an industry agnostic fund. Um, we have committed that 70 to 80% of our funding will be carved out specifically for WA operated or founded companies. We do have a 15% carve out specifically for health, by the way. So if you're in that industry, we do have to make health related investments. I can explain why later. Um, we think it's a great sector. And um, I'm tired because for the last six months, I've been raising money um, with Kylie, who you heard from before. And we decided, our view is that if you're going to run a fund, you need a minimum of $30 million for that to be economical for the fund managers, but also venture capital works on building a portfolio of companies. And then you need to be able to double down and triple down on the best performing companies. And without 30 million minimum, you can't do that. And so that's what we went after. We talked to 150 uh, plus West Australian investors, and you've probably seen, but um, we, as of last week, did our first close and raised, committed in the bank, $37 million, which is really exciting. So. And we're ready to go. Um, apart from the fact I need to sleep for a little bit and catch up, and we're moving to offices next week, and we're in you know, employment contracts and lease contracts, but give me a week to do that, and then we're ready to go. We've already got companies we've been talking to and obviously have long relationship with many people in the room here today. Um, our investment committee has its first meeting in April, and I would love to put to them a deal and start getting term sheets out um, and um, kind of get on with it. So maybe I'll pause there and pass on. Same question. Same question. <laughs> Introduce your funds, yourself. Good morning. Thanks for uh, having me here. So my name is Pia Turchinov, if you haven't met me before. Um, a long time face, I think, in the local innovation space, so I know many in the room, which is lovely to see. Um, here on behalf of Fund WA. So, you know, like Derek said, we've set up Fund WA as a venture capital firm for exactly the same reasons. I think we all see the same opportunities. We've all complained bitterly over the last uh, 10, 12 years about the lack of local funding and the, um, the need for many of our scale-ups to basically go east or overseas in order to actually grow the companies and follow the capital. So our motivations are similar. To give you a bit of context um, from a personal perspective, I mean, my background has been in business for the last 30 plus years. Um, the purple hides the grey. So <laughs> just to put that into context. But really, even harking back from my early days as a lawyer, one of my first uh, portfolios was intellectual property and IPOs. So it seems quite ironic that 30 years later I'm back in this space. Um, fund WA, our philosophy, so we're an early stage technology investment fund. We will invest from C to Series A and are looking to fill that gap because WA funding is very heavily skewed towards the pre-seed. We've got a very vibrant angel investment ecosystem here, but as we know, it then gets harder as you're looking for those bigger checks and you want to scale up and stay local. Um, a lot of the vision behind Fund WA is to be attributed to Glenn Butcher, who is our CEO and lead. I don't know if you've met Glenn, but Glenn is a local WA boy who, um, as the story often goes, went east, made good. He was an early stage Atlassian employee. AWS has got some serious deep tech experience. Retired and went into the venture capital space over east. Uh, for family reasons, young kids, and because of the lure of what WA stands for, you know, the beauty, the lifestyle, all of that, has decided to move back and really was quite conscious about wanting to contribute back into the West Australian economy. And the idea behind what we're doing with Fund WA is to help diversify and scale what's already here, but really amplify and speed up that growth rate. Absolutely thrilled that we've got other venture capital funds in town. This is not a one horse race. This is not one is the best. We need to actually create a vibrant venture capital system so that you have choice. And also we won't invest in everyone, obviously. Yeah? It's a bit like a dating game. You need choice in order to find the right partner. So we need that that variety, and I think we've got a great start with where we're at. Um, we are a $50 million fund. 
we will invest in high growth, high scale export ready benches that are technology backed. Our geographic platform is 100% WA. So we will only invest in companies and businesses that have got a West Australian mandate. Now, that means that we look at where your registered principal office is, where your IP assets are developed, and where your mass empl employees sit. Recognising, though, that we're going to do follow-on investments, and it may well be, obviously, that you scale, you grow, your geographic footprint changes. But in the early stages, we need to see West Australian companies, and we will only invest in West Australian companies. So uh, we've put the uh, flag on the hill, so to speak. So do us proud and make sure that you actually show that we've got that deal flow that the East Coast for so long has said there is no deal flow in Western Australia. You don't have enough to make it worthwhile. So let's prove them wrong. You can ask me more questions so, as we go. When are you looking to... Oh, we are live. Right. So let me just quickly uh, make a distinction here. So we are not an ESVCLP fund. We took a very different tack. There is a second option, which is a managed investment scheme. So the way we have set up, also nine months of blood, sweat and tears at the back end, um, there's a lot of legalities and a lot of financial hoops that you need to jump through in order to get a venture capital fund up and running. The reason we went for an MIS scheme is that it gives our investors different tax incentives and it helps them actually leverage the ESIC status of many of our um, startups that we're going to invest in. So from your perspective, it doesn't really make a difference as to what the fund structure is. It works exactly the same way. But from an investor perspective, there are different benefits that we're trying to leverage. So we are open for business. We've already had um, investment committee meetings. So we are ready to cut checks, so to speak. Um, and yes, looking forward to seeing deal flow come through. Nigel. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Nigel. I'm representing Quokka Capital here today. Uh, thank you, Pia, and thank you, Derek, for the intro. I think you'll probably hear the same answers, I think, from most of us, especially about this WA industry. Um, a quick background on me. I'm from WA, grew up in the southwest, spent eight years in the US, uh, came back because of COVID in uh, October of 2020. Uh, uh, big thanks to Charlie Gunningham, who started to com connect me very quickly back into this this ecosystem. Um, I had no idea what I was going to do when I got back um, and I didn't realise, I was one of those 25 year olds back when I moved to the US thinking I've got to get out of Perth and I don't ever want to come back. Um, I came back in October of 2020 and quickly saw all of this, this vibrant ecosystem that was thriving, that needed a whole lot of different other elements in it as well and everything was amazing. And I said to Charlie, like, where has this been? I never heard or seen this before. So fast forward two years, I've been on this journey two years. I had a cornerstone, we were about to close, then we decided ESVCLP, that's been another year of journey. And, and to Derek's point, I'm exhausted. Um, it's cost a lot of money to get to this stage. And I think the whole point about this story being about you is that our experiences of a fund, we're a business as well. Like we've gone through everything from planning to meetings, to raising capital, to having a million and one setbacks. Um, and we're fortunately feeling like we're at the end of this whole getting this thing set up. We're not live yet. Um, we are targeting a $25 million plus fund. Um, it will be ESVCLP. Uh, our mandate is going to be C to Series A. And I think from my perspective, I've always been active in, in everything I've been in, whether that's been investment or not. And we have felt like there are certain things that startups do struggle with, especially in that C to Series A phase. And, and we kind of narrow it down to human capital, early growth and funding. And we really want to utilise our networks and be a part of the ecosystem. We don't want to be the only thing here. Um, and we really want to support people, not just with capital, but with each one of those elements along the journey as well. Because if we write you a check, you're probably a small team. You've got a to-do list that's two million things long. And it's a big struggle to then go out and get your first sales with probably a Figma mock-up and a really, really bad MVP. Um, you need to then get funding. You need to tell your partner you're probably not going to make rent or, or mortgage this week. So we really want to be a part of that journey. We don't just want to be passive. Um, so it's been important for us to, within ourselves and, and for you guys as well, to have the right structure. So we have gone forward, we've gone back, but it's been for all the right reasons. And we're really excited to be here with Pierre, here with Derek, and with everyone else that's a part of this community because I've seen a lot around the world and travelling and living abroad and there's inefficient markets, there's efficient markets, and I really do feel like that Perth 
has everything it needs to be a very big um, engine room for Australia, not just in mining, not just in real estate that we're known for, but in this tech startup ecosystem as well. And it needs more of people like us. What I like about us all telling the same story, I think you'll get very different results in our investment philosophy and criteria. I think what's unique is our different experience, our different investments, our different execution. And I think that's what we need. We need as many funds as we possibly can here in WA, not just investing in WA, but also across the country, because I think we need reach and eyeballs coming back here as well. And that will then produce talent, that will then produce better startups getting um, started here as well. So I'm excited. Um, I feel like, again, I probably need three months sleep. Um, but I think ultimately we have a lot of great people here and I've met some of you, probably not all of you, but I'm excited to go on this journey. And as are um, Pierre and Derek, I think we're all here for the long term. I mean, Derek's already been in this, in this sector for over a decade. I haven't, um, but our plan is 10 to 20 years. I'm still young, I'm from Perth. I have a small family. I'm gonna be here forever and I really wanna make an impact because this industry affects everything. It affects small business, it affects schooling, it affects education, it affects government budget. So I want this to work because I know it's gonna affect everything else as well. So yeah, we're excited and I'm glad to be here with everyone else. And, and thank you, Charlie and, and Jetsy and, and everyone else for putting together the, the grant. It is, I can understand why there hasn't been an ESV CLP here in, in, a, in WA. It takes a long time and it's expensive. So I appreciate the support um, and I appreciate everyone's patience as well. Um, and everyone, that if there's anyone in this room when it was announced, and I'm, I was talking to Pierre and she had the same, I didn't know that it was announced until I looked at LinkedIn and there was about 150 requests and as many messages. So if I haven't got back to you, I apologise. I will in time, but there was a monsoon of, of messages and reach out and that's how I knew it was announced. I kind of picked my phone up and was like, I better check the news because I think it has been announced. So thank you to Jetsy as well. So, and I appreciate everyone's support. So just, um, just run the street. Run the oh, I can. <laughs> so we've got... Well, it sounds like two different types of, uh, of funds here on the panel. So may maybe uh, one of you can explain, like, what, how does it start? How, do, how, does, a, how does a VC work? How does the, the long letters work? You know, how do, how do you start that journey and, and um, who's involved? Yeah, so I think, I mean, a couple of things. You, you're kind of looking at a venture fund. Um, I think, as Pierre said, by the way, don't worry about the letters. It's kind of not relevant for most people in the room, but I'll, I'll explain it in case you're interested. But... At the end of the day, from a venture perspective, there's two audiences. One is our investors, uh, and then the other is the startups and founders that we invest in. For our investors, which is not this audience, but just to explain, you have to understand that venture capital is probably one of, if not the most highest risk asset classes they can invest in. And what that means is we're going to invest in a portfolio of companies uh, in reality maybe 50, 60, 70, 80% will fail or not return money. And so we're relying on a couple in that portfolio to do really, really well. So when you're pitching to us for funding, if you can imagine what it's like for us to pitch to investors for money, and I'm not entirely sure everyone's mechanism, but in our case, we've, we've structured a fund and that means all the money comes up front or versions of, and it's a 10 year fund life. So if you can imagine, the pitch for Kylie and I to investors the last six months has been, hey, we've been doing this for the last 10 years, it's kind of gone okay, um, but could you give us money, minimum $1 million, and we're going to lock that up for 10 years, and I think we're going to be able to do what we did before, but I can't tell you what we're going to invest in, can you just trust us to get it right? That, that's basically the pitch, right? <laughs> it's a good pitch, yeah? <laughs> And uh, every now and again, someone goes, yeah, you look like trustworthy people. In fact, most people said, we don't invest in a first fund. We don't think there's enough deal flow in WA. Um, but hey, you guys look like you know what you're doing. We'll put a toe in the water. And for the people we were talking to, that's a million dollars, which is kind of crazy in itself, right? And, uh, and so that, that, that's kind of what it means for investors. And we have to think about the structure. It's effectively a financial product. So I'd worked previously in an environment where I had an AFSL and I've structured financial products before, but you have to design that. You have to think about the return profile, the cost profile, the team that you're going to put around that, how you're going to fund that, and all those kind of things. And so, you know, I think you're hearing from all of us, we've, we've been working really hard to get that right um, before we can even get anywhere to this kind of conversation and say, hey, we've got money for you. 
and I think Nigel's point was right, is we, we are a business in our own right. I, I haven't run a business since GreenSense. It was 10 years ago, and I forgot that I've got to sign lease documents and employ staff and all these things, and I'm like, I just want to invest this money, and we're, like, trying to set up a company, and it's crazy. Um, just a little bit for those that might be interested. There, there is a couple of ways you structure a venture fund. Um, you've heard these these words, right? So an early stage venture capital limited partnership, which we call an ESVCLP, is a common way. It was a structure set up under the Venture Capital Act back in 2007 by the federal government to stimulate venture capital. The reality is back then there wasn't structured venture and it's a pretty short time, right? It shows you how young the Australian market is. But here we are, whatever it is, 15 years later and there is billions of dollars. There's also a scheme called the VC hold on, early stage, yeah, VCLP, which is like the next layer of funding. So um, in Perth, actually, UR Capital, who was around previously, had that structure, but it's for a slightly later stage and, and attracts foreign investment, so some differences there. Um, the reason we do that is that it means our investors actually get an immediate tax offset for money that we invest through our fund, but actually pay no capital gains or income tax for the life of the fund. So if you can imagine for an investor, that's a really, really, just as a financial product, that is a really attractive product. Um, now there's reasons why you might not do that, and so what you do is you set up, as Pia mentioned, as they're doing, called an MIS, a Managed Investment Scheme. You just think about that more like a managed unit trust that you might be familiar with, but it's a private version of that. Um, and again, that has some kind of variances to it. Actually, in our case, we have both. So we have an ESVCLP and what's called a stapled MIS. Those things actually um, require you to invest in certain types of companies, and I think Pia was alluding to this. So for us, in an ideal world, 50%, oh, sorry, a company we invest in, 50% of the staff have to be in Australia and 50% of the IP has to be in Australia. Now, that's only for the first 12 months that we invest in that company because obviously we're about backing a company that can scale globally and that profile might change over time. But at the point we invest, that's what it needs to look like. And if we don't do that, then we don't get the tax benefits through the ESV CLP. So in our case, the reason we have the MIS is if we find a great investment that we're prepared to give up those tax benefits, we've got a vehicle that we can still invest in that company. And that's kind of important because there are some companies in Perth, for example, where you may outsource your software development to another country. And all of that headcount, whether it's a contractor or an employee, matters in terms of the profile that we need to consider from that tax perspective. Anyway, that's for investors. For you guys, what does venture capital mean? Well, uh, my view is, is if you're trying to build a business, you need fuel for the engine and you need enough fuel that gets you to the next milestone, ready to put fuel in the tank again to get to the next milestone. And there's lots of different ways, and today is not the topic of this conversation, but I've done in various forms, of all the ways you might fund your business. There's grants, there's crowdfunding, there's angel investment, there's friends, family and fours. There's all these methods that you may choose to raise capital. By the way, the best form is your money and then customer revenue. They're the best two. So do that before you come to us, ideally, if you can. Um, but one of the versions of funding is venture capital. Um, and so you should absolutely consider that because now there is capital in Perth. Um, you just need to think about, is that the right type of investor for the funding that I need for my business? And there's a few things to think about. I would say, no matter what money you take, do your due diligence on us in the same way that we do due diligence on you. Ask questions like, have you done deals before? Have you had exits before? When you had an exit, how did that go for the founders? How did you treat the founders? What got stuck? What size checks have you written before? Like, ask any question that you want. And one of the things I'm really proud of is that in Better Labs, we've invested, as I said, in about 30 West Australian companies. You can go and talk to any one of those. You don't need to ask me, just go and talk. And I know what they'll say about us as an investor. Like, go and talk to them to do that kind of due diligence. Um, and then you need to understand that with venture, um, and I'm not sure in everyone's case, but certainly the ESVCLP side, is we have a 10 year fund life. So when I'm investing in your business, I'm thinking about what that journey looks like over 10 years. And ultimately, because of the high risk asset class that I talked about, I'm looking for a high return. And that basically means no matter what you convince us and we agree to your valuation today, at a minimum, I'm wanting to make sure we can 10X that together over that period of time, uh, because that's the only way I can get the return profile I need that I've promised to my investors. And I'll pause there, because I could talk about this all day long, so. Okay. I think it'd be a good segue at that point to, um, unless you, do you want to add anything to that? I'll, I'll just add, uh, yes, not reiterating what Derek's already said, but we're also a 10-year fund, so it's very similar. 
have to stress is a portfolio that we're actually building. So when you get rejected by venture capital, it's often not because your business is necessarily not a good idea. You might be able to build a great business. It might not be a venture capital scale business, firstly, or secondly, it may not fit into our portfolio in the way that we need to have a good breadth and scope as to what we need in order to optimise the investments from the investor point of view. The other thing I'll say is I'm constantly getting asked, how much money have you got to give away? So <laughs> we are, at a, first of all, we don't give any money away. We invest. So we invest for reason. From the moment we invest in you, we start looking about when is the next raise. All right. So you can't sit back and go, great, I've got a cheque. Now I can just go back and start working with some more. We will actually push and work with you to get you ready for that next round because that will be relatively quickly. Um, with the with the idea around portfolio, our investors, so we have got a target of $50 million fund. It doesn't work from a investor perspective to have $50 million sitting in the bank that you can't deploy immediately. Now, we could deploy immediately, but that may not make the best decisions. So you actually have an 18-month fundraising period that we are doing in order to get the investments in and then at the same time parallel that to actually cutting checks. So it's a dual process as opposed to where Derek is at the moment where you've got fixed fund in there, you've got that money and then that's how you're gonna go. And there's a slight difference there, I guess, because of our missions and purpose-driven versus a, a different um, mission perspective. Perfect. So, so do you want to add anything to that? Oh, no, no, perfect. So we'll, we'll, yeah. go, we'll go to Nigel then, yeah. specifically around, on the, the question of portfolio. Are there any specific industries or sectors, one that your fund is looking at, or two that you think is going to be particularly exciting over the next five years? Uh, I think for Quokka, I think Derek said he, he's a portion in a part of purpose to health and things like that. I think we're either right or wrong. I think we are going to stay out of things where our core discipline doesn't have any experience and that would be health, that would be biotech or anything like that. If you can think anything traditional tech, you could call that SaaS, whatever you like, I think we'll concentrate in those areas as well. Um, I think w what I'm excited about is I, I think what COVID has done, especially for Perth, I, I think it's opened everyone's eyes to the ability to be able to globally scale a lot faster than I think everyone thought they were, were able to do previously. So I don't have a specific industry or anything right now, um, but going back to, to Derek and Piers point, I, I would definitely say to everyone here, if we, if it's not right for us, there is a myriad of reasons why. It could be sector, it could be what else we've invested in, it could be it's just not VC backable right now, it could be my own perspective, I could have been burnt in the past and you don't know that in, this, in the same company. So like, just say F you and go and talk to Derek, go talk to Pete, go talk to the next person. We are not the end game. We want to be a part of the system and we want to be able to support that, but we can't back everything. And I think that's a very important thing because I have had conversations, not in this realm and, and elsewhere, where you say no and it is personal, um, but it then comes back to me as like, oh, they didn't like our startup. It, that's not the truth at all. It's just there's a whole lot of different reasons that we've got to equate for as well. And it's fund size, it's area, it's team, it's, it's everything else. So I think what has also been important, we're not live, as I mentioned before, but just even in the last month with three or four different um, occurrences, I'm still getting, even though I'm telling people just to wait until I get this thing set up, I'm still getting decks, I'm still getting intros, and I'm still trying to play my part. So there's been three or four occurrences where we can't do anything, but I have introduced them to people around the country that do invest in this sector. So it may not be right for us, but we all do have a network, and I do believe in the network effect of having everyone grow through here that is humanly possible, um, because I think it's going to come back and support everyone as well. And we haven't designated a percentage of WA investments. We want it to be as high as possible. But I do believe that if we can all do this together in the right ways, that there will be more and more and more here in WA. And I think I always look to, and, and maybe it's not the right example, but I always look to Austin, Texas in the USA as a very good example of what Perth potentially can be. Maybe not in scale, but they set up slowly and surely over a number of years. And then they had the right infrastructure, they had startups starting to go there, they had talent. And then California did what California did. And they kind of tripped over themselves and now everyone's leaving San Fran and they're moving elsewhere. And Austin, Texas was a big benefit of that. I kind of feel like the East Coast has had its time and I feel like WA has everything it possibly needs to become that next kind of example as well. So it starts here. I've only been here the last two years. Um, I was away for a very long time and there's people like Derek and, 
and the like that have been here and put in the long yards to be able to get this ecosystem to this point. And I think now it's just about taking the next step. Um, and we're doing the same thing. Like, I should have given up 17 times. Um, I really should have. There was a lot of other things I could have done. But I really, truly believe in, in what we're all trying to achieve here. And I think it's going to be super exciting to see. So I don't have a sector. I think me, it's WA. And I think it's these people here that I'm kind of confident in and that we can back and I'm hoping that we can get those 10 plus X returns because um, I think it's going to be an exciting time over the next decade. Can I just add to that as a big tip is engage early with us. Don't wait until you're at the cliff and you're desperate for the money and you've got you know, six weeks left of runway and suddenly it's like I need investment here. So start the conversation early with the proviso that be prepared for the conversation. Okay, so, and, you know, Nigel said, when we get hit up on LinkedIn, can I come talk to you, all of that, that's great, but you need to actually be prepared for the questions you know we're going to ask you. And if you don't know what questions a VC is going to ask you, do your research before you come and ask, okay? Uh, to just answer that question, so Purpose Ventures, we will invest pre-seed through to Series B. Our preference is that we come in as your first large institutional check and then journey with you. Um, it's what we've done really, really well at Better Labs, talk to our companies there. We typically invest first time um, if we, you know, you might have a few angel investors, but we'll write the largest check. Check sizes, to be honest, our first check needs to be really at least half a million dollars for you because if you're raising less than that, the money runs out so quickly um, and ideally a little bit more, we're happy to co-invest. Um, and then our largest check size will be sort of circa three million, two to three million as we get into those later stages. Typically what happens is, um, once we've done that first investment, uh, a bit like Nigel was saying, we'll, we'll come and meet monthly and help. Uh, and we've got a really, really, really good track record of taking companies at your seed investment to your Series A and getting the uplift I'm talking about, that 5 to 10x, we can do that between seed and Series A and help you do that. And we can help you find the check for your next round. Typically, what we've done in the past is say, hey, you've done everything we're expecting. We'll let you go to market and we'll already support you with, say, a million dollars and you might be doing a two or three million round. We'll help you find those investors, but we'll let a new investor set the uplift on valuation. So we don't revalue our own investments, um, but we can help you through that entire journey. Um, we are industry agnostic, as I said, with a 15% focus on health. Just keep in mind when I say health, that's matched against a 10 year fund life. So it's not really life sciences and biotech. Um, we're probably thinking more digital health and things that can get to market and commercialise and see exits through that lifetime. Um, I think we'll take questions at the end, yep. Um, and um, where was I going? Sorry, in oh, and obviously it's Kylie and I, we also have a network of venture partners and then broader mentors that help in that expertise. So I'm a software guy, that's how we made our money, it's what I've done for 25 years, really good at that. Um, but if we're investing in health, we have Dr. Dr. Marcus Tan, for example. Um, Brody was in the room, I don't know if Brody's here, but everyone knows Brody. So Brody's one of our venture partners and um, helps in all sorts of amazing ways, including mornings like this. Uh, we have Nicole Lockwood, for example, who's great with government and infrastructure projects, and, and the list goes on. So um, whilst we're saying industry agnostic, I'm not claiming to be the expert in all industries. We've got people that can help in our due diligence and, and provide those other industry connections and expertise that you might need. Perfect, perfect. So, so what is it specifically? So you're going to get, you know, inundated, as you are saying, Nigel, you're getting, you know, lots and lots of presentations, lots of pitch decks. What is it specifically to you that you look for in a company when looking to, to invest. So what is it that kind of gives you that spark that says actually we're going we're gonna to give this company a term sheet? Um, I'll keep it short because I know we're running on time too, but um, uh, okay. we're seed to Series A. I, I think predominantly our investments will be seed um, and most of our follow-ups will be Series A. Um, and I think when you're at that seed stage, you are still very early on, right? So there's a lot of things that we look at as a criteria, but it may sound cliche too, but I think the number one thing that I look for at that early stage has to be the founders, right? And there's a whole lot of different things we can look at that. But I know very early on when I got started, um, they backed me. They didn't back anything else I had. They just believed in what I did and, and my level of um, experience. And to, to Derek's point, I think when you do come to us, 
do your research on who we are because like Derek just said, he's in software. I'm not a software guy in the sense of a developer engineer. I'm a growth guy. I've been in sales and marketing and customer success for a long time. So that's the brain that I look at every investment in. I then have other people that will look at it in many different angles as well. So to me, it's people. Um, then we've got product and everything else. But we want to go early, as Derek suggested as well. And I think that's why there's a lot of synergies with what we're all doing here. So I put a very big emphasis on people. Yeah, I mean, we cut checks between 250000 and a million in the first instance with the opportunity for follow-on investment, so very similar. We've developed, I guess, the benefit we have is that um, Glenn and Emlyn Scott, who's part of our venture partner group, have run two venture capital funds over East before. Uh, they are closed for investment, so there's no uh, conflict anymore. But to give you an idea of success factor, they've just been named in the top five performing funds in their fund size worldwide. So we've had the benefit of taking all the learnings from two venture capital funds over East and applying it here. Um, I'd like to say it is about you, the founder, yes, but it's also about more. So we've got quite a complex developed a proprietary evaluation matrix. So uh, we will run you through a series of different questions. Again, no great surprise is what we'll be asking, but our process is very much around where are your weaknesses, where are your strengths, and then balancing that up as to where we see the opportunity. We have four general partners in our fund. So there's myself, there's Glenn Butcher, Ashish Malaney, who comes out of the New York London finance sector, and we've got doc Dr. Michael Nguyen. So again, we've got that med tech um, experience in-house, plus in venture partners around cyber, as well as uh, broader tech sectors. So similar, you will be meeting the whole team, you will be asked questions by the whole team, and there is a process. It is not just a coffee meeting at a coffee shop, that sounds good, let's write up a term sheet, off we go. So be prepared for due diligence, and do your homework so that you can answer the questions that we're going to ask. So in our case, th there's three things, there's lots of things we look for, um, lots of due diligence, but the three main things, uh, number one, as everyone said, is, is founders. Um, and it's kind of obvious, but let me say a couple of things on that. Um, your business model, if you're a founder right now, is probably wrong, your pricing's probably wrong, your product's probably wrong, and that's the point, you're a startup. And so what we're looking for, to be honest, is founders that we can trust that are actually chasing after what I would call your deeper life cause. If there's something in you that you're trying to solve right now, um, that is what you think your life is about, you probably already have inbuilt the resilience to get out of bed in the morning every single day when it gets tough and to keep going to find a way to solve that. And so that's what we're trying to align to. People sometimes misunderstand when we're saying purpose ventures that we are a social impact fund. I just don't see those things as different. I think if you're a founder, and you're creating something new, you're probably going to try and do something that makes the world a better place. And if we can align to that purpose and what you're trying to do, that's what it means, right? So, um, so that's the first thing um, in terms of uh, backing you as a founder. Um, and we're looking for that resilience and know that we can uh, work with you. I've got a whole spiel I do on three things, character, chemistry, and um, competency, which I won't do now. Most people have probably heard that. Um, but those are the three things at a high level we're thinking about. Um, the other two things that matter to us, the, the next thing is innovation. Uh, we're, we're backing an innovative ecosystem here, right? It's not a small family business. It's not something that's been done before. It's something that's innovative in the industry that you know really well. Now, when I say innovation, what I'm not saying is you're building the rocket ship to Mars because that's great innovation, but that has such a long life and we've got commercial outcomes that we're looking for. So I think the best form of innovation, and keep in mind, innovation isn't just technology. Innovation could be operational efficiency, a business model, a pricing, um, customer service. There's all ways you can innovate. And we're really looking for the one step improvement from the way things are done right now. Because I've seen, again, great success of companies that do that. So you're innovative, but it's just a little bit further than where we are at the moment. The third thing then I would say is large markets. So yes, we're all about talking around WA today and backing WA founders, but we want you to take on a large market. Now I'm not saying, um, and some venture funds will do this, say, hey, be global from day one, take on the world. I've taken companies into other geographic regions and it's flipping hard work. I don't really want to see a plan that says we're going to be in 10 countries next year. But what we do want to understand is what's that large market that you're going to be able to 10x the size of your company from now and 10x again in your next round because you can understand who your market is, 
that it's big enough and that you're going to be able to win a, a pretty big portion of that. So those three things that are really high level of what we're looking for. Perfect. Thank you very much. So I think what we'll do is we'll, we'll call it that because I'm sure there are lots of questions um, for people wanting to ask. So who's got a question for this great panel? Let's go straight. Very quick there, Jesse. Hey, guys. Just one question, really. Uh, understanding here what you guys are saying, these guys have been working really hard on their businesses as well. So I'm really curious to know your business model. What's your expected pre-money valuation that you would accept as an approval region? And then what do you move into the next one after that so you'd be able to get your equity positions? And what is that normal closed position that you want to hold? Before you answer that, I want, this is a good question. This is founder to founders here. I think as founders, we all need to be realistic about our valuations. The high days of 2020, 2021 have all gone. Let's get realistic. So, but I'm interested to hear your answer. I'll make it very short, reasonable. Don't read headlines. Yeah. If you read a headline, there's probably 10,000 behind that that were nowhere near that. So just reasonable is my word. Okay. Yeah, that there is no one box. Yeah. Here you go, we need you to tick that box. It just won't happen. Yeah. But it's, it's early stage. It's early stage as far as from a fund portfolio goes, that if we come in too late, because of the term fund, you know, you've got 10 years, that means you're not going to exit in year 10 as far as the fund's concerned. You're going to probably have a seven-year runway where we want to see an exit. So you need to think about where does that growth journey fit in that seven-year time span. If you want to exit in two years' time, probably not a venture capital-friendly you know, model. So think about where your journey sits within the fund life. Just one other quick thing too. Derek alluded to the portfolio X percentage failing and we've got a 10X to make. So the way to think about it is, is in our portfolio, I'm writing everything to zero and there's going to be one that's going to be successful. So if you, if I'm believing that your one's going to be successful, but your valuation is way too high for me to get that fund return off your exit, I'm going to say no purely based on that. So I may love everything you're doing and I want to write you a check, but you may be slightly too high. So the feedback we always get is, oh, you just want more equity. I'm like, I don't necessarily want more equity. I just want it to be fair and reasonable for everyone, right? So think about it. My word reasonable is there's no little black box to say you should be at this at this level because everything's different. It's be reasonable for all the factors and, and we can't decide that. You guys have to come to us typically. Um, and then the market will determine what you guys are all value at, are valued at ultimately as well. But that is a big part of it. A big part of our assessment is can we actually make the fund return off this investment? And if your valuation is too high, that just means those numbers in that spreadsheet that we use or in our mind that we work this out is gonna be a lot more difficult for us to say yes as well. Let me give you two really practical answers to that question. Um, it's a great question. First answer is a lot of time founders will come and go, I need to raise a million dollars and it just feels right I should give no more than about 10% of my company away. <laughs> when you realise I know you just valued your company at $10 million. And I don't mind if you have, but you just need to be able to objectively justify that. And a lot of people say it's hard to value a startup. I do not believe that's the case. And again, it's a session for another day. Um, we've got some very clear objective ways we do that. And I'm happy to share that literally with you, walk you through that. Um, but ultimately, you need to think about your future business model. It's probably wrong, but the day we invest, we're all investing on that plan. So let's use that as a tool. There's probably comparative data. So look around in your market, who else has got money and what that might be valued at. So you can think of ways to objectively justify that. But don't come in with a, like you, you can see it very quickly when you know founders have that perspective. But let me just, de can I just demystify this for you? Because I've been doing this for a long time and I've watched all the deals we've done and all the follow-on deals and all the deals that we missed out on. If you want a rule of thumb, Almost every round that you raise money, there or thereabouts, despite what you think, about 15% of your equity is going to be given up. Now that gives or takes 5% here or there, but it doesn't matter how you do the maths. It doesn't matter whether you're talking to Airtree or us or Blackbird or whoever it is, it's about 15% every single time. So if you look at your business model for the next 12 to 18 months and go the gap of funding is a million dollars and that's what we need to get to the next, next milestone to increase value, you can have a pretty good idea of what the venture fund is thinking in terms of what that valuation is. Now there's negotiation up and down here or there, but honestly every round pretty much lands about there to be honest. So if you actually want to kind of come in with your eyes wide open as to what it needs to be, just use that as a rule of thumb. I also reiterate there is no better money than your own or customer money when yeah. building your business. 
Hi there, Nick here from Vaintech. Just wondering, uh, I'm, I'm just interested in your thought processes around different sectors and the different sort of stages of advancement for different sectors. I know everyone sort of likes having their sector treated as its own special flower, especially health in terms of uh, like high regulatory bars to entering market and that kind of thing. But um, in, in versus, I don't know, like a, a tech startup or something like that, that maybe can get an MVP out there quicker. Uh, just wondering what your thought processes are around evaluating those and stages of advancement and milestones and things. I can see where your question's coming from, given the <laughs> industry you're in. Uh, we are industry agnostic, but you're right. I mean, each industry vertical you will assess differently. It goes back to doing the, the analytics and, and comparing that market space. Um, I don't think... So we've taken the stance that, yes, life sciences, biotech, definitely on the cards. It depends on the stage that you're at. And don't forget, it's where the exit for the VC will happen. Um, your, your industry is a long journey. There's lots of regulatory hurdles. We want to see that you've acknowledged that, you've got a plan on how you're going to tackle that, and that you've got realistic expectations and a risk assessment as to what's going to happen. So it really comes down to risk and likelihood. Uh, we need a plausible, deniable lie from you, in effect. Yeah? <laughs> No one can read the future. No, it doesn't matter how much a venture capitalist says, you know, no one knows what's going to happen. But you need to have the data where you can make a plausible assumption that this is something that is likely. So it's a broad answer, but yes, nothing's off the table. Hi, guys. Uh, everyone knows me except for Nigel, I'm Andrew. Uh, my question's around uh, WA Venture. So uh, obviously we haven't had any really big venture funds here, but we've had access to Airtree, Blackbird, Square Peg, if you've got a, you know, they'll take, an, they'll take a meeting. So my question is, what does it actually mean to Perth to have proper venture capital locally? And if, you, if someone in here is sitting on the next cracking idea, you know, what makes your venture fund the one they should go with instead of one of those other big funds around the country? Good question. I'll start off with it. I think, you know, being locally backed from the get-go sends a strong message to the rest of the venture capital world. Very often it is, you know, well, why aren't you getting local backing? You've got local angels, but then what? Previously, you've had the excuse, well, you know, we don't have any local VC funds. You don't have that excuse anymore. And I think uh, we are early stage investors, so we're coming on the journey with you. We will lead, we will follow, we don't mind. But the idea that we can build venture capital locally is absolutely for not just look at the Victorian model. You know, Victoria, Queensland, New South Wales, and around the world. This we are not doing something new. We are simply, let's be frank, catching up where a lot of other cities are already at. So the ability to keep the local growth here, build the talent pipeline, actually attract other innovators, attract venture capitalists locally, I think will just be a benefit across industry sectors, across the community, and just from a diversification point of view that we're no longer just seen as a one horse pony. Oh. I thought we got to reverse pitch then because you asked why our fund over other funds. But you were going to ask that at the end, weren't you? I was, but go on. Do you want to wait? Or? No, you can do it now. Oh. Um, I, I mean, just to comment on the East Coast funds, we've co invested with most of the funds that you would know in one way or another through our portfolio. Um, it's really interesting because they will say they have an eye on the WA market, but quite frankly right now they don't care. They're probably going to start changing that view and occasionally someone will come out for a conference or whatever, but unless you can get a warm introduction to someone on that team, you, if you just reach out, you probably don't get a meeting to be honest and, and that's, you know, I guess an area we can help because you know, some of those funds are billion dollar funds. So I can take you to your series A and probably your series B, but you're gonna need more money if you're gonna to get to the growth that we're talking about. So the network that we have of those venture funds is actually still really important. Um, and I think it was, I think I saw Nigel's comment in the business news article this week, which I actually was really liked was, we are about WA here, but it's not about WA only. Like we're part of a national ecosystem as well. And the connection your early stage investor has to that network is really important. Anyway, that aside, um, in terms of Purpose Ventures, I think there's a few things I'd say. It's, it's one is that I've been a founder. I've sat in your shoes. I've raised money. I've run out of money. And I kind of understand what you're trying to do. And so because of that, we are doing our absolute best job to be a founder-friendly fund. Now, lots of people would say that. But what that really means is if you come and have a meeting with us and you get to that point, I probably can tell you in that meeting what we're going to do. Um, if not, it will be no more than a week. One of the things I hated as a founder is you'd pitch and then you'd never hear back 
And then you'd be wondering, are they waiting for me to call because that's me showing hustle? Or if I call, am I going to be annoying? Or do I just wait to hear from them? And it's just this horrible dynamic. And so we just want to make that easy for you. At the end of the day, if we decide to invest, we want to do it really quick. We want to get you the money and get you back to building your business, not going through some long extended, non-required process. And so I think the element of us being founder friendly is something that's really important for you to think about. Um, and the second thing is, is I've, I've been doing this, just talk to anyone in Perth about how we do it, how we go about it, um, and the fact that we've got the, the follow-on investment um, to be able to do that journey with you. Um, those things are really important. Kylie's trying to tell me something as well. Did I get it? Good. <laughs> I have a general partner who's my wife, and uh, so if I get things wrong, I've got someone that reminds me, <laughs> which is awesome. <laughs> Brilliant. Do you want a yeah, final, okay. final pitch, then we'll... we'll yeah, I'll keep it short. So. Uh, Thank you for the quote, I didn't know that was in there, but I'll have to have a look at that. Um, <laughs> I, think, uh, I think what's important is that, as Derek mentioned, these East Coast funds, you typically need an intro. And I think, back to your question, is now that we're local, a lot of what we're doing and what we're seeing as early deals has come from inner network, right? So there is no better way to get our attention than have someone that we know actually push it forward. Like, that is how I got these three or four deals that I said. There's, one example is very large um, East Coast family office. They've got a one investment director has 120 deals he's looking at right now. I grabbed a deck, I liked it, we can't do it. I gave it to them and went to the top. So back to this point, I think local is always going to be better than you trying to have to go to the East Coast and, and pitch it that way as well. Um, but I, I do want to say, and we haven't done this yet, but like if, if I'm looking at something, I will talk to Pierre, I will talk to Derek, I would love to co-invest with everyone else here as well, and I will get their expertise. So. If you sent it to us, it'll probably get to them, if not already, and, and the other way around. So I feel like that that collaboration between the whole ecosystem and people knowing people is really going to help WA. And that's why when I sat down with Charlie two years ago and I said, I think I want to do this, um, I said, I want to be a part of the ecosystem. I don't want to be it. And I think that is going to be an important element for everyone to understand is that we are all here together. Like we're competing in a certain way, but I would rather co-invest with these guys than not because my probability of success is going to be higher. Network effects are going to be higher. Execution is going to be higher. Experience and talent is going to be higher. So I feel like that we, we do need to work together even though we are all competing in a certain realm as well. And back to that quote that I didn't know was there. We're here in WA, but we need to think Australia wide, we need to think global, and we need to get out of the old school Perth mentality that look like we're shielded from the rest of the world, because we're not anymore, and I think we do have a big capacity to be able to execute really well. And that's what I saw two years ago when I landed. I had no idea what I was gonna do. I dropped in and started to meet people, and my brain went, there's a lot of great talent here, there's a lot of great startups. Like, why doesn't anyone know this? And I started to look through the papers and I started to look online and it's just mining real estate, mining real estate, mining real estate. And I'm like, that needs to change. And I, I don't feel like Derek has done a lot of work and, and Brody and Charlie and everyone else. And I feel like now this is the next step and I'm really happy and pleased to be a part of it and thankful. And I think if we can all kind of come together, I think it'll be a whole lot easier than us working against each other as well. Because we are at a disadvantage to some degree because of the maturity of the East Coast. So I think we need to support what we can to be able to move that along as well. Yeah, quickly just closing out so you know founder friendly yes global focus from day one absolutely and I think um, like like Nigel and like Derek the depth that our team offers it really is a match that you know who do you want to work with who do you want to catch up with who do you want to you know work with on a weekly and a monthly basis it has to be a fit and I think uh, the last thing I'd say is that anyone that knows me knows that I'm a huge champion of diversity. So I want to see more diversity in the deal flow. Um, so not just the usual suspects. So back yourself, come and have a conversation and uh, you know, listen to the advice and the feedback that you get, whether it's from us or whether you get it from anyone else. Uh, but be humble in the advice that you're getting um, while still maintaining, I think, that real passion about what you think you're going to achieve. Brilliant. Round of applause, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you to Derek, Pierre and Nigel. If you are looking for investment, then go and check out the websites. Obviously, you've got Fund WA's um, uh, banner there, but they've all got websites. It doesn't take much to Google them on LinkedIn. And yeah, I'm sure LinkedIn. you've all got a uh, little upload your pitch um, buttons on your site. So that's how you get in contact. Thank you very much, everybody. We have this space until 9 o'clock. Um, we'll be back here in two weeks on the uh, 12th of April, where we will have lovely, the both of you presenting on um, Plus 8. 
So if you are looking for that investment, it's a great program. There's been some hugely successful companies come out of that. Then uh, come along there. I won't be here, but it will be Scott. Um, and I'll be moving around trying to put this place back. So apologies if I'm bumping into you, but I have to put this place back to a co-working space in the next 20 minutes. Feel free to sit around, grab some brekkie. Thanks, Jesse and Keep Space Ammo, Beecham, Space Keep, and everybody else for supporting Morning Startup, and we'll see you here in two weeks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.